Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to our home. Um, tonight, the lecture on my thoughts will be on, I think something that's important for all of us, whether we forgive or file. So, when we hurt, or when we're hurt or insulted, Excuse me. Something reading on Zoom would like something. Okay, sorry for the interruption. When we are hurt or insulted by someone and they ask us for forgiveness, do we really forgive and forget? Or do we just file it away and wait for the scenario to repeat itself again? Do we turn the page? start a new beginning, or do we just wait? Almost an ambush for the same event to occur again, and then huh, we get even angrier than we did before. So, the question becomes, do we forgive or do we just file away? This becomes one of the major roadblocks in our relationship with our spouses and family. Somehow, friends and strangers are usually exempt from this problem. We just look at them differently and we use a different yardstick to judge them. We have the ability to kind of brush off their words or the incident and just move on. This is almost like little children. They don't carry grudges. They may be angry at each other and then 10 minutes later they're playing like nothing ever happened. We need to learn from children. There's a saying that goes, forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. That being the case, most of us would agree with the statement logically. The problem is we don't always use our logic. It seems like most of the time our emotions creep in and then they take over. We know what we should do or what we should say. But that's easier said than done. After all, I'm angry, I'm hurt. Logic is the last thing that I want at the moment. We just want to lash out yell at the other person, let them know just how badly they have hurt us. There is nothing wrong with having a discussion about things, words, or actions that someone has said or done that hurts you in some way, but it, it's by far the best way to correct a strained relationship is by the communication. However, timing is everything. When you are hurt or in pain, that is not the time to discuss anything. There is a good chance that you will only magnify the problem and then you'll blow it completely out of proportion. If you can, put it aside for another time and then you can have a calm and logical conversation that may well bring about the results that you're hoping to achieve. I think that one of the problems with forgiving and forgetting is that life is really not filled with absolutes. Many times, many, many of the problems that exist between people are not necessarily able to be fixed quickly, and really, if at all. Sometimes just seeing the other person is trying to do better, even though they haven't reached the point of complete success, should be enough. The truth is that this is an easy statement to make, hmm, but a difficult one to accept. Patience is a virtue because it's difficult to attain and even harder to, to retain. Many times we think we're being patient, when in reality, we are just waiting for the next incident to occur so that we can vent our anger again and lash out with the words such as, I knew it, you always. Many times when we are hurt, we don't forgive, and we don't forget, we, we just become martyrs. We accept our inner pain and discomfort, and, and we say nothing. We are just going to let it go. Hmm easier said than done. Martyrdom becomes more and more difficult with each and every occurrence. Then one day you explode and it's totally out of proportion. Even you are surprised at your outburst. You thought that you had it under control. Your reaction is so over the top that all of you've accomplished is that everyone thinks that you're nuts. And then the hole that you dug for yourself just got deeper. So let's see. If you keep your frustrations inside and say nothing, then you're just filling, then you're just filing your anger. 
It is still very much on your mind, even though it may not be on your lips. Then when you do express your frustration, you explode. Again, come across as a nut. It seems like either way we go, there is a problem. So, is there a solution? You know, I had a close friend who realized that I had done something that was stupid. He thought it was funny and said something that bothered me. Initially, I let it go. But then he continued to chide me, bringing up my mistake, rubbing in the fact that I had screwed up. You know, I felt bad enough about my error, and I really didn't need to hear him remind me about it again and again. Finally, in total frustration, I exploded and gave him a loud and stern reprimand. I wasn't happy with him. I thought that what he had said was insensitive and overdone. I thought he was a jerk. And I was upset with him and let him know in no uncertain terms. I just couldn't understand how someone could be so insensitive. Well, it just so happened that shortly after this incident, I saw another friend of mine talking to his wife. <laughs> he said something to her. And when I heard his statement, I was surprised. Uh, he's a smart guy. And he just said the stupidest thing imaginable to his wife, who was a tough lady. Well, right on cue, she wasted no time reprimanding him. And I, I chuckled and I gave him some shtick about his dumb remark. After all, it was so obvious that she was not going to be happy with his statement. Now, it seemed like every time I saw him after the incident, I would bring up his lack of tact and I would laugh. Somehow, he wasn't laughing. Though I didn't intend to do so, I was enjoying myself at his expense. Now, if I had mentioned it once or even twice, well, that may have been acceptable. However, I brought up the incident again and again. And, you know, finally it dawned on me huh, that I was doing to this friend exactly what my other friend had done to me. What a wake-up call. I wondered how my friend could chide me the way that he did, and here I was, doing the exact same thing to someone else. I apologize to both of my friends. We are all humans. We all make mistakes. That's the reason they still put erasers on pencils. So how are we to deal with other people? I think the answer may be by first looking at ourselves. Someone once asked me, what was my greatest strength? And I said, my weaknesses. Yes, my weaknesses. They allow me to see and accept weakness in others. I always compare the challenges that we all face in life as bubblegum. We are all stuck on pieces of bubblegum. Of course, to us it feels like cement. But to someone else, they can easily see that it's only bubblegum and not cement. You know, changing isn't easy. Imagine if someone enters your room and then they suddenly stop. You ask them why they stopped and they answer because there's some bubblegum under their shoe. <laughs> you chuckle. It's only gum. You tell them to lift their foot. They say they can't. You know that they are standing on gum, but to them, it's not gum, it's cement. This is how we many times perceive our difficulties in life, based on our own individual personalities. We all have to learn how to lift up our foot. Coming to the realization that we can lift our foot is great, but it's really a process. It doesn't necessarily happen overnight, if at all. Sometimes we just need to keep trying, and even though we may fail, but I don't believe that if we really try, that we really ever fail. Failure only exists when we give up. As long as we try, we will always learn something new. In the end, every situation that we experience in life will help us to get better in some small way. We just need to stay in the game. As an ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu stated, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You know, we read in Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of the Fathers, from Tarfin said in 2.16, Lo elach ligmor, ben 
which said translates to mean it is not incumbent upon you to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. When we take an honest look at ourselves, we realize that we too are stuck on our own piece of bubblegum. That fact should hopefully help us so that we can become more patient and forgiving to others. I find that another saying by Akabi Menalal in Pirkei Avos, chapter 3, Mishnah 1, helps me to deal with this challenge. In the Mishnah, he states, Akabi Mel said, reflect upon three things and you will not come to sin. Know from where you come from and to where you are going and before whom you are destined to give an accounting to. Now, in English, th these words make perfect sense and are easy to understand. And this is why we study our Hebrew books in the vernacular. Many times the translation will leave out a word or, or misinterpret the meaning. Every word, every letter in our Hebrew text makes a difference. And there is a reason why it is called the holy language. When the Mishnah says, And before whom you are destined to give an accounting. The word accounting in our Mishnah is a translation of two Hebrew words. They are din v'cheshman, judgment and accounting. Now the Hebrew is essential because when we read these two words, we see that the order is really backwards. It should read in Hebrew, cheshbon the din, first accounting and then judgment. After all, in the court case, first the lawyers present their evidence, cheshbon, and then the judge or jury decide the judgment, the verdict, the din. Since we know that all words are important, what are the order of these two, he, two Hebrew words telling us? Somehow, your court case is decided even before your advocate can prevent, present evidence on your behalf. But how is that possible? We see examples in the Torah of such a scenario. One with, was with King David, Dovon Amalek, with his affair with Bathsheba. Rather than tell the king that he had erred by taking Bathsheba, the prophet told the king a story of a rich man who had many flocks of sheep, and his poor neighbor, who had only one sheep. The rich man was having a party, and so he sent his servant to take the poor man's only sheep and serve it to his guests. So the prophet asked King David, what should be done to the rich man? Huh. The king was incensed. He ordered that the rich man should be executed for his theft and lack of decency. The prophet then told the king, that he was the rich man in the story. You see, David had many wives, and Uriachiti, Bathsheba's husband, had only one. The king had unwittingly passed judgment on himself. So too in our lives. When we see someone else who does something foolish, sins in some way, or hurts another person, we many times condemn that person, articulating their sin and passing our judgment on them. The problem is that we unwittingly are passing judgment on ourselves. However, if we can look at other people's failings, understand and try to mitigate their culpability, then in reality, we are really showing kindness and compassion to ourselves. Another way that we can change the way that we judge others is by looking into Pirkei Ovos, the ethics of the fathers again, in chapter 1. Mishnah 6, we read, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prakya Omer, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prakya said, Have done as kol adam lekav Judge every person favorably. Again, we have a case here where we need the Hebrew to really understand what it is that the sage is trying to teach us. You see, the English translation leaves out a key Hebrew word that changes the meaning of the whole statement. The Hebrew word is kol, all. I kind of like the fact in the gematria of kol is 50. For one, give a person a 50-50 break. A simple word that gives us a much deeper and truer understanding of what this statement is trying to teach us. We've heard, all heard, that beautiful women need to hear that they're beautiful. But why? 
They look in the mirror daily and they can see for themselves that they're knocked down gorgeous. You would think so, wouldn't you? But that's not the case. See, it's really very logical. Every woman has a flaw, even the most beautiful of them. When they look into the mirror, all they see is that one eye is a little smaller than the other. Their ears are too large, their hairline is too high. It makes no difference what it, flaw in the, in the mirror that they see. They think that when someone is looking at them, all that they are looking at is their flaw. And this is what the mission is telling us. When you judge someone, judge kal ha'adam. Look at the entirety of the person. Kal. We all have flaws. And by themselves, well, they're very recognizable. However, when we look at them in the context of the whole person, well then, they barely exist at all. More often than not, a person's assets will far outweigh their flaws. So, can we actually forgive and forget? Or do we just file? Maybe, just maybe, if we can think that when we judge someone else, we are really judging ourselves. If we can look past their individual negatives and try to see their overall positives, then we may actually at least try to see other people as humans and not angels. And with that, may we sweeten our verdict on our day of judgment. You know, the second temple was destroyed primarily for one sin, the sin of sin is chino, baseless hatred. The sad truth is that it still exists in the world today. It's much easier to be critical and judgmental of others. What a waste of time and energy. All these negative feelings only feed on our physical and mental well-being. We all call, need to make a sincere effort to change our sinaschina, our baseless hatred, into avaschina, baseless love. Loving someone just because they are one of God's creation. As it says in the Torah, kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Sikenu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. I wish you and your family a good, a happy, healthy, and safe week. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. God bless and be well.